text this morning is uh, uh, Austin read us the, the key passage there this morning that uh, uh, we've been rescued from the domain of darkness. And I wanted to just give us a sense for what that could mean. And uh, so I have, I have a story uh, that, uh, a real life story that, that happened uh, eight and a half years ago now. But on August 5th, uh, 2010, 2010, um, uh, the tunnels of the San Jose copper mine in Chile collapsed. Uh, there was instant panic. Over 33 miners uh, below all of the rubble. And they didn't know if they were dead or alive. Um, no one knew for two weeks. So for two weeks, if you can imagine this, uh, these 33 miners were trapped in this cavern that you see in the picture here. Uh, imagine 14 days, two weeks. Uh, being there, not knowing if the people up above, 2,300 feet above to the surface of the earth, that's almost a half mile down into the earth. And being in this cavern and not know if anybody knows you're alive, or if they've all assumed you, you died in this and they're not doing anything, is there going to be a rescue of any kind, can they, is it even possible? All of these things going through the minds of these miners down there. That would be a domain of darkness for me. Now, this picture that you see here was in fact after a preliminary drill found them in this cavern. Because uh, after two weeks, uh, this is just to give you a picture of the uh, the mine tunnel going down. Here it is, a half a mile up to the surface. Um, and this is the area of the mine that collapsed, and they were located down here. And the, uh, well, right here. This is what they call the refugio, the refuge. And, um, and this is in Chile. And so what they had to do was to drill down and see if they could find any, any response. Was there, was, could they even drill down and find an open cavern? And would there be somebody in it? They didn't know. And prior to that, all the miners had were the lights on their heads, on their helmet. And those didn't last two weeks. I don't know how many days. I didn't, couldn't find that in reading any place. How many days, nights, did they exist together in that cavern with no light at all? Have you ever experienced that, by the way? Have you ever been in a cavern, a tunnel, where there was no light? It's an eerie, a really eerie feeling. Uh, in South Orange County, there's a, there's a whole bunch of mining tunnels that exist from the early 1900s. They used to do a lot of mining out there. And there was a shaft, mine shaft. I used to take high school students there. And we'd scramble up the hillside to this, find this little opening, and then we'd we crawled into the opening and it opened up into kind of a cavern mm, about this size of the room, about this tall, not quite this tall, but just a, a space that was maybe six feet across. And then there was a tunnel that went back out from that space. But there was still light coming in from the front there, but as you started walking down the tunnel, there was no light at all. So you had your flashlights. And I used to take the, take the kids down that tunnel away and then turn the flashlight out. And then I'll go, ooh, I'm scared. Because it, it, it was, you could feel the darkness. It was scary. If you can imagine being in that space for days. And again, not knowing if you were ever going to get out. So when I read the scripture that says that God rescued us from the domain of darkness. We're going to talk about what kind of darkness would that be in our lives. That God has rescued us from but that we could under understand and sense what it means to be in that darkness. That's why I gave you this picture here of, uh, let's see, did I, I miss one? It seems like I missed one here. Okay. Well, when they, they sent the, the first 
a five inch drill down and they found into the into a, and they found an open cavern and when they pulled the drill back up it had that message uh, right here was attached to the drill and it says estamos bien in el re refugio, refugio uh, los 33 so it's just we are we are well in the refuge and it was signed the 33 so they were all celebrating this is the president of the country of the country who was who was present there when that happened but uh, when that came up everybody celebrated on top of the fact that they were alive and they're there but now we got to get them out mm -hmm. and so all that celebration that uh, soon dissipated because it was another 52 days mm -hmm. before the first man made it to the surface so they had this five inch preliminary drill, they, they could follow that five inch drill down to the cavern, but they had to, they had to create a, uh, well I have it, let's see if I can show you this one or not. Um, over here, this was the, the rescue vehicle they had to build, create, it was a tube like this, I think it was something like 14, 15 feet long, and it had a chamber in the middle of it, it was like 21 inches uh, how many did I have? Yeah, 21 inches in diameter, uh, this tube. And, uh, and they had a door on the side there with a cage, kind of screaming thing here. And they could take up one man at a time in that cage, and then they pull it up by the cable that came with the thing. But they, first of all, had to drill a tunnel down there uh, that was 28 inches in diameter through rock. And it took them 52 days to accomplish that. But they made their, they made their drill down after they were discovered that were there. And um, this is the, the picture right here. The first man who came up, the first man who made it up out of the tunnel uh, from the, the, through, the, through this. And it took, it took a couple hours just to get the capsule down to the bottom and then a couple hours to get it back up. And they had to do that for all 33 individuals. Actually, 34, because one man on the top volunteered to put his risk at life, his life at risk, and being the first to go down in the capsule to tell everybody there how to use it and to align them and to, to get them set up. Someone had to tell them how to do that. And someone had to volunteer. And one man was willing to risk his life, and I may get stuck down there with the rest of them. There's always the risk of a cable getting stuck or breaking or something happening, and or part of the tunnel they just drill collapses or anything, but he put his life at risk to go down with that first capsule and there to instruct people and to bring them back up to the surface one at a time. This was a mine, a mine shaft that collapsed in Chile. And, uh, and they were there for 52 weeks and then an additional 52 days before the first man got to the top. So that's a long time to live in that little cavern that, uh, that you saw in the picture that was there. So I just, you can see the celebration of people as they all arrive back up at the service one at a time. You can imagine the families, uh, the spouses, the kids. Uh, and uh, this is the whole group of 33 in the presidential palace with the president and his family there in, uh, in Chile. It was a great celebration uh, of the fact that this rescue happened, that, it, that they actually succeeded and succeeded in, in bringing every back, in everybody back up to the surface. So I want to get you a sense of when God says that he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his son. What that's like, what could that be? And I said, in my sense, when I, I don't do well in close quarters. Uh, I think I have a name for that, claustrophobic or something. I don't know how I would have handled uh, 52, 14, 60, 70 days in that cavern like that. I'd have, I'd have been, maybe, maybe you just do a meltdown and from then on it doesn't matter. But uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which uh, 
there would have been a lot of relief, celebration that went on when you found yourself delivered from that situation. Now, part of the thing I was thinking about when I was, I was preparing for this, like I gotta say, I don't think there are many of us in this room who know very much about being in darkness. We've had some difficulties in life. Uh, friends mistreated us, or they lied to us, or they ignored us, or they neglected us, they forgot, they created a party and we didn't get invited, uh, you know, or, or we have a, a class that we're taking that's real important for something that we're, we would like to achieve in our life and we don't do well on the test. And it's like the whole world has caved in because what I dreamt to do had my future camp upon this, I didn't perform in the way that I needed to perform. I, I don't know what, what creates darkness for you. There are, there are a, lot of, a lot of young people in this world who have uh, come home from school or from work or wherever to discover that mom and dad aren't getting along and they're separating. And all of a sudden my whole family, my life is disrupted. And I don't, I don't there's, uh, there's other times when uh, someone you really care about doesn't care about you. And there's that sense of rejection that comes. I, I, don't, I don't know what darkness is for you. Um, maybe it's, uh, it's not feeling like I'm a winner, you know, I'm a loser. Uh, maybe it's feeling like uh, I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. Uh, there was a moment of darkness in our life when Carla and I walked out of a doctor's office and the doctor just told us that Carla had five days to live and there was nothing they could do for her. That was darkness. And uh, I just remember in that experience, I learned something about what it was to be rescued from the domain of darkness. So we went out to the car and I, we sat down and I said, I, I don't know, I don't understand. All I do know is that uh, God causes all things to work together for good. And we're going to trust Him. And on April 30th, that will be 16 years ago. So those five days have been stretched a long way. So in a sense for us, that was rescued from a domain of darkness in our life. Uh, and I just said, there's, I would that we could, we could understand what it means to be in a situation where we're pleading for help and don't know how to find that, or don't know for sure with confidence that there's a rescue coming. But uh, Paul wrote to the young believers in Colossae about the rescue God has performed in their behalf and in our behalf. And in the context that was there, um, uh, the scripture we just read, for God rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The, the darkness in Paul's mind to the Colossians, if you don't understand what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross, and you've not embraced that for yourself, you're destined for an eternity. When you're done breathing here, you're destined to eternity separated from God. A place the scripture calls hell place of torment. And I'm going, you know, that's hard for me to even imagine that. Other than if I could imagine what it would be like to be in the, the bowels of the earth for 70 days. But what Paul wanted the Colossians to know is that God sent his son who of his will delivered himself over to the Romans to be crucified on a cross for a purpose far beyond the Romans. The purpose for which he went to the cross was to die taking all judgment that could come upon us on himself. And God the Father judged the Son and all the sin, all the, the 
neglect, the rebellion, the self-centeredness, all of that that God could judge us for, he judged in Jesus. And if we believe that he did that for us, we are rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred by faith in what Jesus did on the cross. We're transferred from that destiny of hell to the kingdom of his dear son. And we know and experience the forgiveness of our sin. And I suppose you could say to me, hey, I, you know, I, I hear the story, but I don't get the sin part. I don't do anything bad. I'm, I'm squeaky clean. Well, all I can say is you just haven't lived long enough to be aware of all the self-centeredness that comes out of your heart. Or are you aware of that? Maybe a little. Huh? But it's those things for which Jesus will die for us. And so, I'm looking at this passage with you. It says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us uh, to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And I think you can see the parallel to the mine rescue. Um, while the miners were in darkness, helpless, desperate, one from above, one of their co-workers, climbed in that capsule and came down to deliver them. And in a sense, that parallel, you see that what Jesus did in coming from light as a coexisting with God the Father. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself and became one of his, uh, a servant, became one of his own creation. Taking on flesh, and became a servant, became obedient even unto death. And that there was one who came from above to transport each one of them one by one to the daylight above. There's, there's another whole perspective of darkness for me. Um, uh, through my high school, college years, I, I would say the, the world I lived in, uh, the culture of that day of our country was one of integrity, it was one of uh, courage, one of sacrifice, uh, it was one of a sense of destiny for good for everybody. Um, but there was a value system that was present that is gone. It is no longer present in our world. Integrity is a very rare commodity in the world we live in today. Everybody lives for themselves and to gain all they can get. I don't, when I say everybody, I, I'm not... I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying it feels that way to me in the world I live in. Uh, there's no such thing as individual privacy and responsibility. Uh, there, there are entities in our country who know absolutely everything there is to know about you at this point in time in your life. And it's all in their server. And all that data they pull and sell to people who want to market you. That's a fact today. And they don't care anything about you. The integrity, the value of an individual means nothing in the world we live in today. And to me, that feels like deep darkness. It's just for me. And there are times I, I despair. <laughs> and I say... Uh, I'm on the tail end of life. The number has grown since the last time I talked with you. I think I told you that there were eight or nine peers who have died since September. Well, in the last four and a half months, the number is now 11. We buried the last one last Friday. And they have two more that aren't expected to live all that much longer. And they're all peers to us. The difficult thing for me in that is that I'm older than most of them. Uh, I'm healthier than most of them, at least to my knowledge. Um, but I do know I'm temporary. And given the world I live in, there are times when I say, Lord, take me home. I'm done. 
I really don't want to spend any more time here. Can you take Carla with me, though? <laughs> and then I think Carla, and can you take our daughters and, and the grandkids? Can you take, you know, and then I start down my list, and I go, all right, you gave me breath, I'm going to stay here. So how can I influence the world I live in? How, how can I help individuals living in this darkness, and many of them totally unaware that the world collapsed between them and the ground above? Just ignorant of the darkness they actually live in. But when they become aware of that darkness, what, what rescue is there for them? And I say, can I be here to offer a message of hope? Can I, can I be here to offer a message that God is, that God loves us, He cares about us? He's involved in our lives. He's sovereign. He has the ability to do whatever needs to happen in our life. And even far beyond the existence here, that there's a God who beyond all of these things offered his life as a sacrifice that I might have a relationship with him not only here and now, but for eternity. So as long as God gives me breath, that's the message of hope and a, and a path out of darkness that I want to share with the world that doesn't know. And God has granted us the privilege to be the bearers of that good news. This life is not about us. Don't get lost in the culture. We each live our life openly before God. Honor Him with what you choose. I think I may have got carried away with you just a bit, but I really said the things I wanted to say, but I left my notes about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> well, I'm going to move with you here a little bit further. There's a pass, the rest of the passage here, 15 through 20, I think, here. Uh, it is a description of the one who has delivered us from the domain of darkness. The statement was, uh, for he rescued us from the domain, or transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, his son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. And then in verse 15, it says, he, this is the son, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, if you were created, why does they use the word born? So, I weighed that a long time, I struggled with it. There's a group of people in our world um, who profess an understanding of Scripture that's very contrived and, uh, and conflicted. And they say, Jesus, a very good man, was not God's son. And they say it's even here in the scriptures, here in Colossians, that he was born. God can't be born. Well, that's what we celebrate at Christmas, was the coming of the Son of God in the flesh. Born of a woman, having not had relations with a man, a seed planted in her womb, by a miracle, by the creation of God. Born of a virgin. Lived out his son 33 years here on the face of this earth. Living a life of love, care, and compassion. Delivering a message of love and hope. And offering his life as a sacrifice for us. But he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And I thought, well, firstborn in the sense of the eldest of Cindy is our eldest, the firstborn, meaning firstborn in the sense of order. He was the first out of order uh, in rank. And we'll see in a minute why that's important to us. We keep reading through the text. But he's the image of the invisible God. Remember? 
Remember in John chapter 14, Jesus was with the disciples that last night before he was arrested and crucified. And, and uh, they said, uh, he said, uh, don't be afraid. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I'm going to leave you for a while, but I'm going to go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And, um, and one of the disciples says, well, we don't know where you're going. Um, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, you know me, you know the way, you're okay. And, and one said, just show us the Father. That was the other statement that was made. And what was Jesus' response to that? He who has seen me has seen the Father. He's the image of the invisible God. God fleshed out for you and me in human history. And I, you know, I've, I've talked with grown men my age who said, Ed, that's just a folk story, it's folklore, that's not, that's not real, it's just a nice story. And I said, really? Are you connected to human history any place? Do you know, don't think about historians, you know, they write, well, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, well, do you know who some of the Greek historians were, some of the Roman historians were? And he said, he said, uh, oh, yeah. I said, do you believe that Socrates was just, a, were those just uh, thoughts attributed to somebody, kind of like Shakespeare? Or were, was this a real person? Was Socrates a real person? So yeah, I, I believe he was a real person. Do you realize there's less than three pieces of evidence that Socrates ever lived? And do you realize that there's like 18,000 pieces of evidence that Jesus lived? Did you know that? No. Well, wake up and learn, pal. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? It's just that can we? God revealed himself in human history that we don't miss him and know and have an idea. Morning. Morning. All right. There's uh, notes on one of the pages there for you. The, uh, so here we are. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. You know, there was as a, an early believer, I always had the kind of the picture is that God the Father was the one who created all things. And then I reading through, I came across Colossians here, and it says that Jesus was the the was the one who created all things. Well, so there's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then I went back and I read the creation story again in Genesis. And I thought, something I totally missed before. It says, let us make man in our image. The plural, pronoun, us. And I'm going, that's curious. The Father, Son, and the Spirit present. In creation, the Spirit hovered over the waters. Uh, you, you have, a, in the beginning, God, singular, created uh, the heavens and the earth. Uh, but we have present, that plural, let us make, you know, I'm going, okay, I got this down. And then I read in John, the Gospel of John, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things that came into being, came into being through Him, the Word. And then it says in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. In reference to Jesus, again, Jesus was the Word in the beginning and the one who did, who created. He said, you know, I can't get my head around all that with, with the same clarity that I might answer in a test someplace in physics. <laughs> but I, I come down to her, listen to the scripture, what it teaches me about God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus was attributed as the one, the element, uh, the one entity who created. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones, dominions, and rulers, and authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. He's first. First in rank, first in line, as the firstborn child would be. 
and he holds all things together. I still remember my physics class uh, like decades ago, but remembering as we were talking about molecular structure and how things are and how things function and what makes, what is, what is space, what is, what is, uh, what is a ray and what is a particle, uh, what is tangible, what is, and then we got down to looking at a molecule and looking at a cell and like it's 99% empty space. And he said, how can it, and yet we're, the, the prof was saying, I'm standing in front of you, you see me as a whole person, but I'm really air. <laughs> and, and I said, and he said, and somebody in the class asked the question, so if that's all we are, what keeps us together? And his answer was, cosmic glue. <laughs> he said, there's just a, an element of physics that we don't understand, but there's something that glues it all together. And I read this passage and I said, and in him all things hold together. And I said, okay, I'll give you that credit. If you created all things, you know how to hold it together. And, but that was my thought about that. And it says here, it goes on and says, he is also head of the body of the church. So he's not only God in the flesh and creator of all things, he's in charge. What's a church? There are a variety of definitions that I find out there when I look, and people take pride and build their whole organizations around how what they think church is. If I come away from scripture, church is not a location, it's not a building. We use that terminology. What are you doing Sunday morning? Oh, I'm going to church. Well, where is it? Well, it's on Myrtle. It's just right at the, at the boundary of Monrovia city limits. If you see the city limit sign, turn in the driveway. You're, you're there. It, that's where church is. So what do you do there? Well, we go to church and we do things. And I go, so that's our understanding of church. Because that's how we use the words. I mean, how else do you talk about what you experience? But we use it that way and totally miss something. So there's a, there's a whole area of ministry that exists today in Christendom uh, of church planting. And what that means is you find a leader, you find one who could be the pastor, the leader, the spiritual leader of the group, and you find a location and you start inviting people to come to it. That's what church planting means. And half of the people who come tend to be people who are already believers and were in churches they didn't like and so they came and so you end up gathering a whole bunch of disgruntled people. And we but now have a church. Now, I'm not making a judgment to anybody, I'm making a general comment, but I think it probably describes most of us, most churches. And I said, that's not the New Testament. That's not the church. We know in Ephesians chapter 4, we know uh, in chapter 2, we know that the church are the gathered believers. We, sitting here, making an assumption, I don't know you all personally, I'm assuming that you have embraced for yourself the death of Christ in your behalf that you are regarded a child of God, that you have been delivered from the domain of darkness from God's perspective. Still struggling with what that means and how I practice it and play it out, but from God's perspective, because you've embraced what Jesus did for you on the cross, you are a believer. I'm assuming that. You have to make that judgment. God already has. And if you haven't responded, He's still pursuing you. I thought I'd let you know I know that. But I come to this and I say, if we're all believers here, we are the church. Wherever believers are gathered, they are the tangible expression of the church in that location, in that moment. There are people gathered over in the building across from us here. The church is gathered over there. And so, if I can understand something about this, that uh, 
he, Jesus is the head of the church, the body, the people. We've all been gifted to be a part of this body. We function within the context of this body for his benefit uh, and for our mutual benefit. But he is in charge of the church. Remember the statement in uh, Matthew chapter 16. That he was with, Jesus was with the disciples um, up on the mount. Some place they were talking there. And, uh, and among the, uh, Jesus asked uh, the disciples, who do, you, who do men say that I am? And they made some comments. And then, and then but who do you think that I am? And Peter's the one who responded, you're the Christ, the Messiah. Uh, and Jesus said, flesh and blood has uh, not revealed that to you. It wasn't your human reasoning that came to that conclusion, but my Father in heaven has revealed that to you. Uh, and then he goes on and he makes in that statement, I will build my church. It's his church, not ours. See, that, that can affect us in how we function as his church in any given location. Somehow we, we take on the business um, model of how you do organization. And so we have our officers, we have our leadership, we have our direction, uh, directors or whatever it is. We make decisions and we plan and we do and we execute. We do all the things somewhere totally without any regard for what God may want of us. What it is that he's doing in us. Somewhere in this, I need to understand that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And uh, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, including us when we gather. That would just help us in how we function together. Uh, you're not... You don't sign on to work with an employer and then do whatever you want to do. You do what the employer asks you to do. And if Jesus is the employer, if he's the head of this us, it's probably best that we go to him and say, what would you like us to be about? And then make sure that's what you're about. As a group, as an individual. You know, for whatever it's worth, I got, I got 50 plus years, pushing 60 years, over 60 years, because I'm now reflecting on it. Boy, time flies. <laughs> 63 years ago, I made a profession of faith in Christ. And I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to follow God. I didn't know that I the scriptures were good suggestions and things you could read. I didn't know that. I just thought God's word was God's word and I needed to respond to it. And I spent my entire life responding to what I read in God's word and seeking to be responsive to it, responsible to God for that, uh, doing what I believed he wanted me to do. And all I can tell you is he doesn't disappoint I have a pile of friends who have made shambles out of their lives because they refuse to acknowledge God. Just don't do that with your life. Watch what you do. Watch what you're becoming. Watch what you invest yourself in. Get to know God's Word. Know what He wants of you. Know what resources He offers to you. Let him be first place in your life. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of the Godhead to dwell in him. And through him, says in verse 20, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven.
probably would have been helpful to you if I'd have shown you the slides along the way. I'm on a brain flow. <laughs> but you hear me. You know what I'm saying. I think you, you've heard me clearly. That through him he reconciles us to himself. I don't know if you've done something that your dad told you not to do, your mom told you not to do. You did it anyway, and you suffered some consequence because of it. And somewhere down along the line, you get the picture that I probably shouldn't have done what I did, and you apologize, hopefully. If not, mom and dad will call you on it. <laughs> but you apologize, and what do you get in response? I'm choosing not to hold that against you. I forgive you for that. Think again next time when you have that decision to make. But there's a choice made not to hold our offenses against us. And that's what God has done through His Son, Jesus. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, God the Father chooses not to hold our offenses against us. He bears the pain of that offense himself. He chooses to bear that pain himself. And Jesus offered his life on the cross for us. That's rescued. And it's reconciled. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, were the things on earth, the things in heaven. So when you get that clear in your head, uh, the light will come on. Uh, you will find yourself not in a dark cavern anymore, but living on top in the light. That doesn't mean you won't stumble along the way at times, but you're in the light. Because you live your life in the hope of God's forgiveness, God's embrace, God's promises, His presence. He will not disappoint you. And you can count on him. And you gotta go sing, don't you? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. It's just Austin has to yes, go. Austin. Austin has to go play the keyboard. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> you got the message. <laughs> All right. Well, this uh, in your notes you're gonna find there, I, I asked the question, so what's broken? you know, that needs to be reconciled. Uh, reconcilia reconciliation implies that there's a relationship that's broken. And it's reconciled. And uh, so I ask the question of what's broken. Well, what's broken is us. Our own heart. And uh, you can read through that. You can read the references there on your own. And the scripture will speak itself. It's really clear. And I, I identified those there for you. I can't tell you that there won't be days that feel dark. All I can tell you is that it's not the truth. It's not dark. It just feels that way. And there are moments, um, there are moments when it, there isn't going to look to be an answer that makes any sense at all and you're going to feel a sense of desperation at times. Go to the one who promised, I am present with you. My grace is sufficient. I'm with you. Carla is the one who God chose to uh, partner me up with in life. And uh, in choosing her, he granted to her the ability to see God's faithfulness and to remind me when I'm lost in my darkness. She does that often. I, I get despaired over computer stuff. I get despaired over phone stuff that don't work. I get despaired over the, the culture we live in today, what it's become. Uh, I get despaired over my physical body that's falling apart. I get despaired over, you know, all kinds of junk. 
And I really don't have any reason to be despaired over anything. I'm in his care. And what else do I need to know? And whatever difficulty may come my way, he knows it. You just love me and align yourself with what I got in mind for you. God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love him and are called to his purpose. And he's faithful to it. I'm just one who can stand in front of you to say that he is faithful to you. I'm another human being who's lived these things and I can say he's faithful to us. He is to you and will be to you. So that's my thoughts for you today. And um, I'll leave you with that. I didn't get past help up there, but that's probably a good screen to leave. <laughs> All right. So I'll give it to you. Okay.